At this point, SSL certificates basically hold the internet together. Every website you interact with relies on its certificate. It's a core part of the security fabric of online service. But for something so widespread, they're not that well understood, leaving a lot of people to fumble their way through the installation just praying their service doesn't end up like this. If you've ever seen this screen in your browser, you're looking at a misconfigured SSL certificate. In this video, I'm going to explain the fundamentals of how an SSL certificate works, but rather than do it from an academic perspective where we all geek out about cryptography, I'm going to focus on what you practically need to know to make sure your services don't look like this. SSL certificates are important for two reasons. One, they provide a way to encrypt communications. And two, they provide a way to verify the identity of a website or service. If you're sending information over the internet, you want to make sure it is actually being sent to the correct place and that nobody else can read it in transit. SSL certificates make both of these things possible. Let's start with the encryption. Don't worry, you only need to know a few surface level details. Encryption on TV is, I've scrambled this information using a key and the only way you can read it is by using the same key. Then of course the superhero nerd comes along and cracks it just in time to save the day. Encryption in the real world is mostly the same, except you're not going to crack it. That bit's just for TV. We call this symmetric encryption where both sides use the same key, and it's how most of your data travels around the internet. Symmetric encryption has one obvious problem though. If both sides need the key, how do you share that key in the first place? If you just send it across the internet as is, someone could steal it and then they can read your information. But you can't encrypt it with the key because then the other side needs a key to decrypt the key. The answer is certificates. SSL certificates enable a different type of encryption called asymmetric encryption or public key cryptography. This time there are two keys, a public key and a private key. The public key is designed to be shared. It's part of the public facing certificate. If you click on the padlock in your browser right now, you can see YouTube certificate and the public key. The private key, well, that needs to be kept secret. Only YouTube should know YouTube's private key. The way these keys work is that something encrypted using one key can only be decrypted using the other key. So if you want to send YouTube some confidential information, like say your password, you can generate a random symmetric encryption key, encrypt that key using YouTube's public key from their certificate, and now you can send it to YouTube knowing that information is safe from anyone who doesn't have YouTube's private key. YouTube decrypts it, and now you both have a symmetric key you can use to transfer information securely. Where this most often goes wrong is that people forget about the private key. The public key is easy, it's part of the certificate. The private key is usually kept separate. There are several ways to store SSL certificates in files, but the two most common formats are PEM and PKCS12. PEM files have an extension such as PEM, CRT, CER, or KEY. They're stored in text form, so you can open them with a text editor like Notepad, and they look something like this. PKCS12 files use the PFX extension, and they are binary files. You can't just open them in a text editor. With PEM, you typically have a certificate file and a separate private key file. It is possible to put both in the same file, but like I said, you normally keep these separate. PFX files include both the certificate and the private key, and they're encrypted to keep the key safe. If you're installing certificates on a server somewhere, whether it be at home, at work, or in the cloud, if all you want to do is reference someone else's certificate, then all you need is a certificate file. If you want to use a certificate to provide your own services, then you also need to install the private key. On Linux, that usually means two PEM files, one for the certificate and one for the key. On Windows, that usually means importing a PFX file instead of a PEM, although the file formats used can vary between applications. Now, if you've purchased a signed certificate from a third party, you might be wondering where your PFX or private key file is. If you've submitted a certificate signing request, a CSR, to a third party, then the private key is probably still on whatever you use to generate the CSR. You need to grab it from there. On Linux, it's probably a file. On Windows, it will be in the Windows certificate store awaiting the rest of the certificate. So import the certificate you've received and allow Windows to match it up with the existing private key. You know if it has worked because there will be a little picture of a key on the certificate icon. That means you have the corresponding private key for this certificate. If it's not there, you're missing the private key. You can then export both the certificate and the private key to a PFX file and take it to another device. You must do it this way. 
If you just import the certificates PAM file on another device, it won't be able to use the certificate because it doesn't have the private key. Let's move on to verifying identity. How do I know that the website I'm connected to is actually YouTube and not just a random server claiming to be YouTube? Well, for starters, the name in the certificate has to match the name I've typed into my browser's address bar. If they don't match, you get this. A certificate has two sets of names though. It used to be we cared about the common name. This is still the name that is first and foremost on the certificate, but these days we don't really care about it. What we really care about is the subject alternative name field. The common name can store one name, whereas the subject alternative name field can store lots of names. That's important because lots of websites use multiple names. Just having one common name doesn't really cut it, so the field your browser cares about and the one you need to get right is the subject alternative name. This part of the website address after HTTPS and before the first slash is the host name. If there's no subject alternative name entry that matches the host name exactly, you get a security error. Bear in mind a typical website probably responds on domain.com as well as www.domain.com. Both of those names need to be in the certificate, even if all one does is redirect to the other. If it can go in the browser, it must go in the certificate. Looking at YouTubes, there are a lot of names here for various Google services. You'll notice youtube.com and also asterisk.youtube.com. The asterisk is a wildcard and it means whatever. Asterisk.youtube.com matches www.youtube.com or m.youtube.com or anything else.youtube.com. It will not match youtube.com, it's something dot youtube.com, which is why plain old youtube.com appears in there separately. A lot of certificate problems occur because people don't match all of the possible names exactly. Now that's all well and good having the right name in the certificate, but how do we know it's legitimate? Couldn't I just make my own certificate for youtube.com? Well, yeah, it's stupidly easy in fact. I can run just one short command in a Windows PC and I have a certificate for youtube.com with a private key. But if I view that certificate, you'll see it isn't trusted. Certificates operate on a chain of trust. And actually, you do too. Let's say you need a plumber. Barry is a plumber. Barry tells you he's a good plumber, but you don't know Barry, so you can't exactly trust that he's a good plumber just because he told you so. I mean, what kind of plumber is going to open with, hi, I'm Barry and I'm incompetent. Now you have a friend called Dave. Dave has earned your trust, he's a good guy. Dave knows Barry, and he tells you that Barry refitted his bathroom last year and did a really good job of it. Okay, so now Barry comes with a trusted recommendation, we feel a bit better about this. We can trust that Barry's probably going to do a decent job because we trust Dave and Dave trusts Barry. This is a chain of trust. When Barry's done, you'll need a Tyler. And now that you've established a chain of trust with Barry, when he tells you there's a guy he always uses for tiling, you're going to feel that that's a safe recommendation as well, and the chain of trust continues. Certificates work the same way. The YouTube certificate I just made is a plumber without any recommendations. How am I supposed to trust it? I can't. My computer won't. To provide that chain of trust, certificates are signed by a certificate authority using the certificate authority certificate. If you go back to the real YouTube certificate and check its hierarchy, this here is the chain of trust. The YouTube certificate itself is this google.com one here. It's Barry's Tyler. The YouTube certificate has been signed by this intermediate certificate authority. If YouTube is a Tyler, then this is Barry. We can trust the Tyler if we can trust Barry. But how do we know we can trust Barry? Because of Dave. This intermediate certificate authority is itself signed by another authority, the root certificate authority. This is Dave. This certificate authority is the root because it's signed itself. There is no one else vouching for it. Whether we trust the rest of the chain all comes down to whether or not we can trust the root. So how do we know we can trust this root certificate authority? Well, because we know them. It's Dave. We go way back. In certificates though, it's because a list of trusted root certificates were pre-installed on your device. In Windows, you'll find them here and Microsoft occasionally updates the list via Windows Update. If a certificate can be traced back to one of these, it will be trusted. If not, you get a security error. All of the trusted authorities in this list have a process for verifying the identity of people or organisations they issue certificates to, and if they fail in that process, they'll get taken off the list. If your certificate is throwing a security error and the names match correctly, check that it's been signed by a trusted certificate authority. 
A lot of devices will come out of the box with a self-signed certificate like the one I created, and they don't have this chain of trust. You need to replace that certificate with one signed by a trusted authority. While we're in the topic of certificate chains, something that tends to get missed and cause issues is it is good practice to serve the full trusted chain with your certificate. If you're installing this in a server, you don't want to just present your certificate to people. You want to present them with your certificate plus any intermediate certificates in the chain. Remember that the client needs to verify the trust all the way back to the root. Give them the full chain so they can check it off. If you don't, most devices will attempt to locate the missing links in a chain by checking online for the intermediate certificates. But this is not guaranteed to work. There might be policies blocking their access, or sometimes they just fail for reasons. If everything looks good and your certificate has a trusted root, but you find it works in some devices and not others, make sure you're serving the full chain. In Windows, this usually means adding the intermediate certificates to the Intermediate Certification Authority store. You want the private key for these because you're just referencing someone else's certificate here. On Linux, you may need to supply a separate CA or chain file, or merge the additional certificates into the same file as your own if you can only supply the one file. Check the application's documentation. You don't need to include the root certificate itself. You can, but it's just wasting data. The client is going to ignore it and check their local list anyway. Okay, last thing, and this is the one that tends to cause the most problems, even though it's the easiest to understand. Certificates expire. They've all got an end date, and if you keep using them after that date... Yep, this screen again. If you think about it, this makes sense. A certificate essentially proves the ownership or identity of a domain, but that ownership may not be permanent. Google didn't create YouTube, they bought it. Perhaps in the future, they might sell it. And they shouldn't be allowed to keep a publicly trusted certificate with YouTube's name that can decrypt YouTube's traffic. Even if they don't sell it, there's no guarantee a bad actor will never manage to steal the private key. There are some mechanisms in place to revoke compromised certificates, but they're not without their flaws. You don't want a bad actor holding onto a publicly trusted certificate with your name in perpetuity. So certificates are time limited. Once the time is up, they need to be replaced. And if you forget... At a minimum, put it in your calendar. Ideally, automate the process so you don't have to keep remembering about it. So that's basically it. Take care of your keys, names, trust, and date, and your certificates should work just fine. Subscribe for more and let me know in the comments what other topics you'd like me to cover. You might want to take a look at this video next though.